Hello, uh, this is George from Ireland. Uh, so this video is about the United Irishman, since I had a request from one of my loyal viewers for a video on this um, very subject. Uh, anyway, so who were the United Irishmen? Well, the United Irishmen, I suppose I'll keep it as plural, since it's an organisation, um, was, sorry, keep it as singular, rather, um, uh, was a radical uh, organisation, political movement in Ireland, in the in the 1790s. Uh, so what was the situation with Ireland um, in the 1790s? Well, uh, we were a sister kingdom of Great Britain. <laughs> We'd um, been um, overshadowed by a much larger neighbour for centuries. First of all, England and Wales, then uh, Scotland entered a union with them. Um, we are legislatively uh, independent. We had a viceroy who was sometimes Irish, who was usually not usually from uh, England, Scotland or Wales. And um, we were a monarchy and our king was the same uh, king as the King of Great Britain. But uh, our monarch never came to Ireland. He spent almost all his time in England. Uh, and I do mean England, almost never going to Wales or Scotland. Uh, so we had a viceroy in Dublin who was the king's understudy. Served several years, then be replaced. See, so we, we had Irish Parliament, uh, we had a House of Commons, House of Lords, um, and uh, that was that. In the House of Lords, there were Church of Ireland bishops, right? The Church of Ireland is a Reformed Church or a Protestant Church, we prefer to say. But the Church of Ireland was very much a minority denomination, had no more than 20% of the population as communicants. There are various other Protestant denominations like Presbyterians, but by, by far the largest denomination in Ireland was a Catholic community and we comprised about 70 percent of the population so um we're obviously mostly agricultural country like everywhere else in the world we had the beginnings of industry in dublin and around belfast um so um obviously the the east coast people have been speaking english for centuries english had spread quite far to the west and um you know on the west coast people mostly irish speaking and some more very remote districts um People couldn't speak English, but a lot of people were bilingual. So, uh, so what was I going to say? The Irish-speaking community was almost exclusively Catholic. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the Protestant community was co concentrated in Dublin and the eastern half of Ulster. Everywhere else had a, had a Catholic majority. In some cases, an enormous Catholic majority. Um, anyway, uh, there were Whigs, like, this, like the Whig Party in Great Britain, the Whig Party in Ireland... So we didn't have Tories as such. Um, there was the Patriot Party, but they, um, and there were many MPs who didn't belong to any party. It was not an era of ma mass politics. Very few people had the right to vote. You had to have substantial realty in order to be permitted to vote. And um, uh, the Catholic majority weren't allowed to vote until 1793. Um, even then, after that, we couldn't become members of Parliament and hold certain offices. Um, what was I going to say? So... Yeah, the, the wealthiest people were landlords. They just owned huge tracts of farmland and uh, rented it out to people. So uh, most people were poor, just scratched their living from, from the stony soil. And uh, some people didn't like paying high rents or if someone was evicted. People would dislike someone for taking that farm for then renting it from the landlord. So there was sometimes there was solidarity amongst uh, the uh, the cottier class. They seemed to live in little cottages. Um, and... Uh, I was going to sorry, come back to Parliament. There's the so-called Patriot Party, as he wanted a greater degree of self-government, or perhaps you know, separating from Great Britain in some sense. Though the people in the Irish Parliament, they were overwhelmingly upper class, or at least upper middle class, and um, few of them questioned having some sort of political connection to Great Britain, because they mostly had fairly recent English, Welsh, or Scots ancestry, only a few generations before arrived from Great Britain, and sometimes they were intermarried with with native Irish people, whatever native Irish is course is it Gaelic could be Danish and there are various other groups that came to one of a prize of them but talking about what was going on in the countryside action against uh, unpopular landlords so those who thought to be rack renters well rapacious landlords were, were attacked or people were fighting over tracts of land so groups running around in the middle of the night white boys uh, as they're called written as one word the boys meaning just any group of uh, rural toughs um, you might call them agrarian terrorists, you might call them freedom fighters, whatever. Would I prefer not to pay rent? Yeah, sure, I would. So does this make this acceptable? Well, I don't think so. And some landlords were rapacious. 
Oak Boys, as in they were strong as oak. Steel Boys, as tough as steel. Peepo Day Boys, peep, the Peepo Day meaning um, dawn, attacking at the Peepo Day and so on. And it's a very confused situation because these were obviously clandestine uh, organisations and the death penalty was used promiscuously uh, in Ireland. Uh, like it could be, you could be hanged for grand larceny. So these organisations had to exist underground not literally underground. And so not a great deal is known about them, just occasionally these people were apprehended and spilled the beans. And people who are white boys in one county didn't, if you're a white boy in Cavan, didn't necessarily mean if you're the same as being a white boy in uh, um, Armagh or something. Okay, they might have different different goals. And some, some of these organizations were Protestants only, some were Catholics only. There was a Catholic only one called Defenders. So there's some sectarian tension, some animus between the two major denominations, particularly in Ulster. And so the Protestant minority um, had a virtual monopoly on political power. There was a corporation in, in Dublin City, as in, count, as, as in city council. There was a, a Lord Mayor of Dublin, obviously. So again, only uh, the, the affluent were permitted to vote for that. And we had, uh, what else is I going to say? Um, uh, Lord Lieutenant in each county sort of appointed elected city corporation cork and so on we didn't have county councils as such we had these sort of um assizes and grand juries but again only people who um were below the property classes could uh, get onto those and there had to be a lot of property there's a certain value you had to own to be there so in a sense it was a plutocracy just like everywhere else in the world at the time uh so what what else did I point out? We did almost all our trade with Great Britain. The American Revolution had been not long before, and obviously some Irish people in America already, some Irish soldiers and sailors had fought there, obviously for the crown, but some of them um, were imbued with a certain sympathy for the uh, objectives of the, the American Revolution and wished to uh, emulate that in Ireland. Hello, Ben Perryman. Like I so said, the French Revolution uh, took place in 1789. So... Um, some people were very inspired by that as well. And in 1792, France declared war on Great Britain, which then also meant Ireland, even though they weren't actually in Great Britain. But uh, our, our king was the same as the person as the king of Great Britain. Um, what else are I going to say? We had an Irish army, of course. There were some British army units in Ireland as well. Um, in each county, we had uh, yeomanry. And uh, the yeoman are, are a social class, those who own a horse. And that made you fairly well off. Most people didn't own a horse. And if you wanted to, if you owned a horse, you could be part of the yeomanry as in a cavalry unit for just defence of Ireland. The yeo they didn't have to serve abroad. So they're quite socially prestigious. They didn't get paid, but they had to pay for their, their own equipment. Um, so they were middle class sort of people, maybe upper middle class. And then uh, there was also militia, as in part-time soldiers, but infantry in each county. If you... Um, you know, owned a musket and you wanted to be in it, you didn't have to be in it. And again, it was unpaid. We had to pay for our own equipment. So there was a certain snob element of belonging to this and swearing loyalty to, to the king. Um, so some people wanted radical reform. We're coming on to the, onto the uh, um, uh, United Irishman. So some people had been in the Whig Party and uh, on the edges of politics, of mainstream politics, like Wolf Tone met some of his friends in the gallery of our parliament at Stevens Green, not Stevens Green, sorry, um, College Green in Dublin. It's called College Green because it's adjacent to Trinity College Dublin, the only university in Ireland. Remembering that a lot of people didn't go to school at all, and the Catholic majority, we'd had, um, you know, uh, the, the the Catholic Church was, was discouraged at the time, and there are plenty of priests, archbishops, bishops and so on, a few monasteries and convents, a few church buildings, but the good church building has been seized by the Church of Ireland when the Reformation in Ireland took place uh, in the 1540s and um, the few good schools were just run by the Church of Ireland who had so much of the wealth everyone had to pay tithes a tax to the Church of Ireland even if you didn't belong to it which obviously caused bitter resentment um, so first of all well there was a 1704 an act to prevent the further growth of popery um, where Catholics we had to get permission to have schools and so on which was very seldom granted or to go abroad for education, again, the permission was again seldom granted, thinking that the clergy would be would be um, recruiting agents for the for the Jacobites, and occasionally they were. But anyway, a Catholic schools were set up, and by the late 18th century, that rule was in abeyance. But there weren't many Catholic schools. Catholics were allowed to go to Trinity College Dublin, though very few of us went 
because this is another money. So some people were completely illiterate. Some people were being taught at a hedge school just outside in the in the lee of a hedge to provide a little bit of shelter. The schoolmaster teaching the pupils. Boys get a get a bit of an education knocked into them. Girls scarcely got any kind of an education knocked into them. This is amongst the, the working class. That's the majority. The middle class a bit more and the upper class. Well, they had fantastic opportunities. Um, but anyway, um, so some people were unhappy with the Whig Party, completely dissatisfied and wanted a much uh, greater degree of um, reform and thought maybe revolution rather than reform was the way forward, looking into the French Revolution. And... Um, you know, the uh, the English and maybe some of the Irish establishment told themselves that our system was, was the envy of the world. We had the correct balance between monarchy, between aristocracy and between an elected element. But the thing is, um, so few people could vote. We had two members of parliament for each county, 32 counties, and two for each borough. And um, there were rather more than 32 boroughs. Um, so a borough was anything was called a borough by the monarch, given a charter to be a borough. We see Dublin was a borough, but Clontofa in County Kilkenny was also a borough. So two MPs for the Dublin city, but two MPs also for Clontofa. And how many people were allowed to vote in Clontofa? One. You heard that correctly. One man had two MPs representing him, because Clontofa is a tiny place. I couldn't find it on the map, but it had been given a borough centuries before, given a borough status, and that was that. So it was completely unrepresentative. And uh, the um, landed classes, they own so much property, they could say, you've got to vote this way or that way. There was open voting, no secret ballot. Or if you don't vote the way I tell you, you'll be evicted. Or if you're on my employer, you'll be sacked. And so they can make life difficult for you. So in practice, um, a handful of aristocrats control almost all the votes. It's a very undemocratic system. Now, I know the whole world was undemocratic, but uh, people thought that France was the way forward. And so the United Irishmen said, let's get rid of sectarian discrimination. These people were largely uh, middle class cafe intellectuals discussing these things. And they were almost entirely Protestants. And they're from the East Coast, the Dublin area or County Down, Antrim, Armagh, one of those. That was um, obviously Dublin was under the heart, the brain and the pocket of Ireland to some extent. And the only other place with a similar society approaching that was Belfast. Belfast was much smaller than Dublin in those days and was a very new town. And it still was a town, didn't have city status till about 1875. Um, remember, it had only just become the largest city in Ulster, Derry being the largest city in Ulster until that time. And till not long before, um, Belfast hadn't even been the largest port in, in Antrim, that being Carrickfergus. Um, so who were these uh, United Irishmen? There was uh, Theobald Wolfe Tone, for example, son of a, a county Kildare coachmaker, and he'd been to Trinity College Dublin, was called to the bar. There was Sims, for example. Hello, Colleen, Kenny. Good, good morning from Australia. Thank you. There was um, Henry Joy McCracken, uh, who was from Ulster. Samuel Nielsen, for instance. Dr William Drennan, who was um, from uh, Antrim, and I think he was a physician. He'd studied at Edinburgh University. Yeah, so Trinity College Dublin was run by the Church of Ireland. The Presbyterians were also discriminated against. Um, Lord Edward Fitzgerald was, was an aristocrat. His father was the Duke of Leinster, as in Ireland's premier nobleman. Um, Thomas Russell, known as the man from God's Hall, knows where. Leonard McNally, another barrister. But Leonard McNally turned out to be a double agent. Um, he defended a lot of these United Irishmen in court, but in fact he'd sold the past and he was telling everything to the government. And he was getting a, a handsome um, uh, stipend for that. An honorarium, or you might call it a dishonorarium. And when he died, it all came out in the wash and people were stunned. They thought he was a stalwart of the cause. In fact, it was a crown agent. And two um, Cork men, Henry Shears and John Shears, brothers, barristers, both of them, there's Shears Street in Cork, named after them. Ro Robert Emmett, only on the edges of it. Um, Thomas Addis, edit his, uh, Edis, um, uh, Thomas Addis Emmett as well, his brother, Roddy McCauley from Ulster, and then more and more of them. Uh, OK, so uh, what's, what's the next thing? So uh, radicalism was in the air. OK, should there be revolution? And the ob what were the objectives of the uh, United Irishmen? Hello, if there to be a referendum on Irish unity in the coming decades, do you think Northern Irelanders will vote to unite with the Republic? Do you see unity as being inevitable? I don't think they do, would actually, although it would, would be close. Uh, no, I don't see unity, uh, so unity is inevitable. I think almost nothing's inevitable in history. Do we have agency? Yes, we do. We have choices. Hello, this is about the United Irishmen, a revolutionary organisation in late 18th century Ireland. 
because, you know, communism was going to triumph. That was inevitable. Or the Third Reich was going to triumph. That was inevitable. Democracies were going to spread everywhere. That was inevitable. Loads of things didn't happen. Um, <sighs> someone's just telling me about the police in Ireland arresting men of Bangladeshi English origin. Well, I didn't know about that. And so coming on to the United Irishman, so they said, well, let's get rid of denominational discrimination and every person of any religious denomination will be on an equal footing. We'll no longer privilege the Church of Ireland and people will have equal opportunities. Everybody, uh, and, and not only also get rid of class discrimination because the state was not class neutral. Remember, only a tiny minority um, could, uh, had the right to be in Parliament and only a small minority had the right to cast a vote. And it was, it was no secret ballot. It was open voting. The polls were open for two weeks and all the rest of it. I mean, so many loyal addresses from uh, leading Catholic citizens, um, affluent merchants and so forth, and uh, minor landlords, to his uh, gracious majesty, George, um, um, of that name, the third King of Ireland, King of Great Britain, and his dominions beyond the seas and all islands unto them appertaining, and all this kind of stuff, saying, um, we wonder whether you would be graciously pleased to look with favour upon this humble petition and grant equality to the Roman Catholic majority. But they got short shrift. Um, anyway, so they said, well, let's get rid of, get rid of sectarian discrimination. Hello, Diane Malloy. But let's also um, level the classes. And every, every man will have the right to vote. Nobody was talking about the right to vote for women in Ireland in those days. Um, and we'll have equal electoral districts and something like that. Um, uh, democracy, a word that was virtually forgotten. Now, um, so France at that time, in the 1790s, briefly granted the vote to women. It was then taken away from them. Why Ireland was taken by England? Romance, oh my God, this is a huge question. So if you go back to um, 12th century Ireland, we're divided into several different kingdoms. Um, a near incessant war between us. We had a um, high king of Ireland at Tara, but he had little power and there was no dynasty. There. So, so the different, different minor royal families were battling it out every few years for that. But anyway, so one of these minor kings, he took a shine to the wife of another and ran off with her. So the goat bloke who had his wife, Nick, said, right, that I'm going to get you back. So the point is the king of Leinster, that's the eastern province, he fled abroad because he was defeated. And he said, who can help me get my kingdom back? Yeah. And uh, so uh, he he found someone who was willing to. Um, uh, this is Dermot McMurrah and Strongbow. This uh, Norman Welsh landlord helped him, came across, defeated the bloke's nemesis. And that was that, got Leinster back. And um, within a year, Dermot McMurrah died of natural causes. Strongbow, Richard uh, Fitzgilbert de Clare was his real name. He, he married Strongbow's daughter, Aoife, and said, well, now I'm the king of Leinster. But then King Henry II, who was king of England, overlord of Wales, came across to Leinster and said, you, you do homage to me. He didn't want another Norman state building up on the east coast of Ireland. And so uh, Strongbow did that in relation to Leinster as well as his lands in Wales. And whilst he was at it, um, Henry II said, oh, yeah, uh, the um, king, uh, the high king of Ireland, Rory O'Connor, has to do fealty to me, be my liege man of life and limb. And Rory O'Connor agreed. So at the Synod of Cashel, the, the Irish church, our, our um, clergy, had agreed that uh, Henry II was the overlord of Ireland. Not the king of Ireland, but he was the overlord. And um, our, our political leaders signed the Treaty of Windsor in 1175, agreeing the same. So both church and state agreed with that. And um, it was a feudal system. So um, our, our various petty kings and, and uh, tribal chieftains, we were a tribal society, we largely ran our own show for a long time, but gradually Anglo-Norman and Cambro-Norman immigrants arrived on the east coast of Ireland, the pale of settlement around Dublin. Is United Ireland a possibility in the future? Yes, it is, Saif Ghazali. Um, and I've said elsewhere how I want it to happen. But back to the to the United Irishman. So um, it was allowed, because we were, it was a very liberal society to begin with. We had very extensive freedom of expression, which you found almost nowhere else at the time. 1791 was founded. But then there was a war at France. They were considered to be sympathising with the French Revolution. Well, they were. Um, and that was that. And you might say that was a good thing, actually. 
So they also decided they wanted to get rid of um, aristocratic titles. So you can call yourself Lord of whatever, but you should have no official recognition. Let's have equality, class equality, religious equality. Um, And why is it that some people are are stinking rich and some people are dirt poor? Well, really, because the the, um, wealthy have all the political power and they make laws to suit themselves and they don't pay very much in tax and they don't do very much for for the poor, the majority. Um, And if the political system was more equitable, then the poor would be in the driving seat and they would frame laws to suit themselves. Uh, They they weren't talking about redistribution of property at this stage or public ownership. There wasn't really an economic aspect to this. Um, They were they tended to want free trade, no sort of import taxes for selling things to Great Britain, which is our main trading partner. And why should we fight against the French? They've not done anything else, else to us. And some people were anglophobic. Despite, despite the fact that these United Irishmen, most of them had fairly recent English roots. And they were entirely English speaking. I'm not sure there's a single Irish speaking one amongst the leadership. So it's really a Dublin or Belfast thing. These guys going up and down by horse or by stagecoach or even by ship between the two uh, cities. Spread into the hinterland just a little bit. And they're in contact with English radicals and, and Welsh radicals and Scots radicals. Indeed, there was a, uh, there was a United um, Scotsman around the same time who had a rebellion slightly afterwards. So one they decided they wanted a republic. And as Theobald Wolfe later said, um, uh, to unite Protestant Catholic dissenter. That's what he wanted to do. OK, dissenter mean Protestants outside the Church of Ireland, as in Presbyterians, Methodists. OK, and to replace those words, Protestant, Catholic, to centre with the common name of Irishman. That's what matters. We're all Irish. It doesn't matter what your religious denomination is. And there was a tiny Jewish community, too. Or indeed your social uh, statuses or your economic statuses. Um, uh, and what else? Um, and to reject monarchy, because that's really the apex of a system of inequality. And we should be lamenting and not celebrating uh, structured inequality. So we, we should perceive this as a problem to be solved and not something to be entrenched by law. Um, so uh, Thomas Paine, that English-American revolutionary, had published his Common Sense book not, not long before, um, which is really a, a, the most famous pamphlet of the American Revolution. Well, it's more than a pamphlet, and he deliberately wrote it in, in plain English, the sort of uh, short, simple, commonly used words that even an illiterate person would comprehend if it were they were read aloud. And no uh, classical allusions or no lengthy words that uh, your average Joe wouldn't grasp. And so common sense became quite, quite popular in Ireland. And um, as, as he memorably said, Thomas Paine, you know, look at the monarchy. Why do we so often get an ass for a lion? A king should be uh, lion hearted. And often we have one who's more like a donkey, completely uninspiring. And by the way, George III, until the 1790s, was actually quite unpopular uh, even in England. And remember, he'd had that episode of Porphyria in 1788, was thereafter intermittently uh, insane. So they said, let's have a republic. And as, as Wolf Town said, break the connection with England. We should, because uh, Ireland, OK, we, there was no active union, but we don't want a viceroy appointed by the king and the king spends all his time in England. We want um, complete separation. Um, and and uh, why should we fight against the French? They don't want to unite with France, but they've got nothing against France. So a republic, uh, like like the French have got, we should be doing the same. Um, so secularism, you can worship in any religious, religious denomination you want, but and the state will not support or oppose any religious denomination. Secular as in um, of the world in Latin, that's what it means. It's not a spiritual authority. Because like in, in our House of Lords, we had the Lord's temporal and the Lord's spiritual. Temporal as in temporary power, earthly power because of their noble titles, and spiritual, because they had spiritual power, as in they were bishops of the Church of Ireland, or archbishops of the Church of Ireland. The Church of Ireland's got two archbishops, the Archbishop of Armagh and the Archbishop of Dublin. Of the of the two, Armagh Senior, the primate of um, Ireland, whereas the Dublin is the primate of all Ireland. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, we've got actually several archbishops, but um, those are the two major ones, Armagh and, uh, and um, Dublin. And likewise, in the Catholic Church, Armagh is the more important one, the religious capital of Ireland. Um, OK, so there was, there was war, at, war uh, against France. The Royal Navy was fighting that. Then we had an Irish army. We didn't have an Irish Navy as such. So some Irishmen joined the Royal Navy. Um, and that was that. And there was, there was a considerable chance France would win. I should not go into all the Napoleonic Wars. But by the end of the 1790s, obviously, Napoleon was in charge and involved so many European countries from Portugal all the way to Russia. It's an immensely complicated story with countries changing sides. 
1796, okay, lot of, by, the, by this time, a lot of the United Irish leaders had gone to, gone to France. Theobald Wolfe Tone amongst them. Uh, he'd applied to be an officer in the British Army, been rejected earlier on. A lot of people said it was a sour grapes. He was 34 years old by this time. Um, and Lord Edward Fitzgerald had indeed been commissioned to the British Army, and at a dinner once he'd suggested abolishing hereditary titles. He was cashiered for that, as in booted out of the army dishonourably. Um, and he had a hereditary title. He's always known as that. There's a book about him, Citizen Lord. Did you ever see Robert Key's History of Ireland first shown on BBC Two in the early 80s? Yes, I did, actually. I watched it in 2008. Um, so um, Theobald Wolfe told he spoke to the French government. It was the directory run by three men. And France as it was in tumult. Um, so it was a good thing. Uh, Edmund Burke, one of our most uh, famous Irish philosophers, he was an MP for Bristol, actually. He was living in England and called himself an Englishman. He was Irish too, but he thought these were compatible. What are we talking about this evening? Please summarise. We're talking about the United Irishmen, a revolutionary organisation in Ireland in the 1790s. So Theobald Wolfe Tone was over there trying to enlist the support of the French and um, France almost in civil war, the royalists fighting against the revolutionaries and the revolutionaries squabbling against each other. So there was the terror accusing each other of being counter-revolutionaries or traitors or whatever and guillotining, guillotining each other. And there was also the war on Catholicism. So France about 95% Catholic in 1789. And then the French government, the revolutionary government, decided they were against Catholicism. They invented their own religion, the cult of the supreme being. Um, so let's have a rational religion, if that's possible. And they invented a new calendar with months like Brumaire, Frimaire, uh, Brumaire, like as in monk, month of fog, like uh, Il fait du brillard, or Ventos, um, Fructos, or Nivos. Um, Ventos is in windy month, Fructos is in fruity month, and Nivos as in snowy month, Thermidor as in hot month, Thermos, like thermos flask, temperature, Thermidor, obviously, you may have heard of. Um, Germinal, like the film, Gérard Depardieu, one, as in a month of um, seeds, like germ. Prairial, the month of meadows. Prairie is a meadow, like prairie, the English word. Um, and I can't remember the other one. Uh, Floréal, as in the, the flowery month, and on and on. And um, having um, 12 months of, um, is it 36 days each? And each day was named after something like oak tree or lime tree or things like that. And then five days of a celebration at the end, around in what's now September, to celebrate the um, is it the the execution of the king and the declaration of the republic and blah blah blah. Um, so the idea was that people wouldn't be able to tell, to tell when Sunday was under this system, and they wouldn't be able to tell what Christmas was, and they would would break things up. They wouldn't be able to keep Christianity going, and and people, some people in France, particularly in La Vendée. The um, northwest of France said, no, this is unacceptable and fought for Catholicism. But eventually the French Revolutionary government kissed and made up with the Catholic Church. But it's very off-putting to Catholics in Ireland. And um, Maynooth had been founded in 1793. Um, uh, so that's a Catholic seminary. So priests are being trained there, funded by the government of Great Britain, not by the Irish government. And the Catholic clergy were brought on side to say, hello there from Nashville, Tennessee, Lady V. Tavora. The, the uh, Catholic Church saying, well, you know, render unto God what is God, to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The powers that be are ordained of God. So saith St. Paul, don't rebel, be loyal to his uh, gracious majesty, King George III, even though he's a Protestant, even though it discriminated against, it could be worse under a revolutionary government, which is anti-religious. We could have peaceful reform under the current dispensation. But anyway, so Theobald Wolfe Tone, um, he was an atheist, highly unusual for the time, not as unusual amongst uh, political radicals. And um, he um, enlisted the, the mighty aid of the French. And Napoleon Bonaparte was making a name for himself. So um, France was moving away from being a democracy to be more like a military dictatorship, had this incredibly, um, how to put it, obtuse and complex political system, separation of powers, where they carried it to the fair, like the Council of Ancients, I think you had to be over 40 to be in it. That was old in those days. Allowed to propose policy but not vote in it. The Council of 500 allowed to um, debate policy but not vote in it. And another council allowed to vote on the uh, proposal for, for legislation but not to debate it uh, or propose it or anything like that. Um, and if that sounds nebulous, well, it was. A political traffic, traffic jam. And 
the civil liberties were being suspended because it was it was a war on. But likewise in Ireland, the, the definition of sedition was broadened considerably. And anyway, the United Irishmen we, we've been we were banned, not we, sorry, the organisation was banned in 1793. Likewise in Great Britain, the freedom of expression was, was considerably curtailed at the time. The London Corresponding Association shut down, the Revolution Society shut down. The Revolution Society was um, celebrating the 1688 revolution, but it was still going in the 1790s. Um, anyway, so Theobald will tell the French to agree. They would invade Ireland. They saw it as the back door to Great Britain. How they, they thought Great Britain is too heavily armed. Most people are pro-government. And it's not radicalism needs being to be explained in Great Britain. There's been a lot of study on that. It's loyalism. People joining the militia and the yeomanry in Great Britain was there a referendum held in the counties by 1921? No, there wasn't actually. I mean, referenda hadn't been held in the British Isles at all by that stage. Um, there was an election in May 1921, and the, the 26 counties of Ireland, Sinn Féin won every single seat outside Trinity College, Dublin. Guess how many votes were cast in that election in May 1921 in those 26 counties? Guess how many votes were cast in an area where two and a half million people lived? Should I tell you how many votes were cast? Zero. Not one vote. Not a single person voted. Do you know why? There was only one candidate for every single seat. That's correct. In 26 counties, about 128 people elected, and there were 128 candidates. Nobody got to vote, but that's another story. Um, so going back to the 1790s, so Theobald Wolftone got the French army to invade, and they said, we'll invade, we will defeat the British army, so which is in Ireland, and the, the Irish army, as in pro-crown, and then we'll help you proclaim your Irish Republic and we'll completely respect your independence. We'll use Ireland as a, as a, as a springboard to then invade Great Britain. Um, I was saying in Great Britain, many people joined these uh, loyalist organisations and militia and yeomanry as well, as well as the army and the Royal Navy. And um, George III became a bit more popular, as Gilbert and Sullivan would say, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of meeting something worse. Uh, not many people loved George III, but he was familiar and they're frightened of the French, the monkey French as they're called, you may have heard the Hangus Monkey story of a um, French ship being shipwrecked off the coast of Hartlepool in northern England and only a monkey was found alive and they assumed the monkey must be a French spy and he was unwilling uh, to answer the questions put to him and he was hanged in Hartlepool. Might be an apocryphal tale that. But so I hang with Hangus Monkey as their, their mascot in, 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 in Hartlepool. Or uh, other things, the... Uh, uh, English uh, thinking that they were stronger because they had the roast beef of old England and good beer and the French were half starved and all the rest of it. And there wasn't much truth in all this. Um, and they were free and, and they were like John Bull and so on. They were sturdy and stout and smoked a pipe and drank their beer. Um, largely bunkum. And what's the other thing? Yeah, I saw a, a recruiting poster for this time for the British Army said, join the army if you ha um, if you hate the French and damn the Pope. Now, how does he make you feel as a Catholic in Ireland to hear that? Not 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 too glad. Um, another thing about I should point out about in Ireland is the Orange Order had been going. Well, certainly since 1795, there's some debate as when the Orange Order was founded. Is it 1795? Is it um, 1793? Is it by Dan Winter? Is it by James Wilson? Certainly in 1795 was the, the so-called Battle of the Diamond, a, a clash at Loch Gaul between the Orange Boys and um, the Defenders as a Catholic organisation. But the confusing thing is there are several rival organisations with the word Orange in the name, so we can't trace the lineage very clearly. And who started it is debatable. The Orange Order initially was only open to members of the Church of Ireland, not to other Protestant groups like Methodists, uh, Presbyterians, Plymouth Brethren or whoever. Um, anyway, so they were very pro-government, though, the Orange Order. And they tend to be strong farmers, as in either own their land or tenants with a fairly large farm, better off pro-establishment. And initially they said, let's drive all the Catholics out of Armagh. And then said, let's drive all the Catholics out of, 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 of um, the whole of Ulster. So they're viciously anti-Catholic. All right, in fairness, Catholics, well, some of us, were very anti-Protestant. Uh, and as, as one um, submission to the Irish Parliament said that the thing is the Catholics in the West, they say Sassanach as meaning English, even they're talking about a Protestant, whether it's Protestant or whether it's um, uh, Englishman, that's the same thing to them, those who can't speak English. And there was a certain uh, logic to that. Anyway, so 1796, uh, Theobald Wolfe Tone set sail uh, with a French squadron 
and uh, several thousand French sailors trying to land in Ireland. And they're going to try and land in Bantry Bay. It's a good natural harbour and a uh, fairly remote rural district could land there and there wouldn't be a lot of government forces around, establish some sort of base and then march towards Dublin, defeat um, uh, the Irish army on the way and any units of the British army who are there as well. No point in landing too close to Dublin because that was a stronghold of government support and there'd be plenty of military units there. Reconnect, reconnect. OK, are we reconnected? Yes, we're reconnected. You don't want to land anywhere too remote. I was talking about invading in 1796. So they got to Bantry Bay, but uh, there was an incredibly strong tempest. Mm -hmm. And so the French ships couldn't land. And near Castletown Bay, there's a town along called Ahabeg. And the French squadron was there with one of the ships was La Surveillante, which sank, actually, and is still underwater. But the items have been recovered. You can see them in a museum in Bantry. And so they were there for several days and the, the um, gales were screeching around them. So there was um, Sir Richard White at Bantry House and he gathered the local militia and yeomanry on the shore in case the French landed and a handful of United Irishmen, Theobald Wolf Tone, that the, the Crown forces were going to give the invaders a very warm welcome, as in fight them. And as it happened, the storm was, it was so ferocious that the French ships were unable to land. OK, um, so you can anchor in the bay, perhaps, you know, a mile offshore, get into your smaller boats and then and then row ashore to land your men, your horses, your cannon. Um, but you want to do that in fairly uh, calm waters, but it was never calm enough because you can't go right up to the coast or, you know, your big ship is going to run aground and tip over. So um, they had to sail back. And um, what's his name? Theobald Wolf Tone, he fulminated, England has had not such an escape since the Armada as in 1588, every 200 years before, where the um, uh, winds blew against the Spanish fleet and the Spanish fleet was not able to land in England in 1588. And so the English had said that that was a divine wind. It was a Protestant wind. The Almighty had favoured them over the Spanish. And some of them felt likewise Irish loyalists saying, you know, surely it shows that uh, divine providence is on our side because the Almighty has scattered the enemy uh, ships didn't really scatter them, but they weren't able to land. Um, but anyway, two years later, things were a bit different. The United Irishmen had spread considerably, propagandized successfully amongst people who weren't so uh, politically literate or indeed literate at all, because um, only about half the population could read and write some of those to a very low level. And um, people hadn't heard of words or concepts like democracy because in almost every country, it was the landed class wielded power. That was it. That was the natural order of things. Few people question that. You might want the Catholic uh, aristocracy to be in charge, not the Protestant aristocracy. But again, it was difficult to imagine that um, every person would have an equal say uh, in, in the formation of the state. So um, Lord Cornwallis, um, fresh from his defeat in, in um, America, and he spent some time in India. He was brought to Ireland, well, in 1798 as our, as our viceroy. We'd had um, uh, Lord Camden as our viceroy, who was... Um, quite stern, very against the United Irishmen. So loyalists thought they had them on their side. By the way, loyalists in those days doesn't imply Protestants. Yes, it's true that most Protestants were loyalists, but there were a considerable number of Catholic loyalists. In the late 20th century, you could be a Catholic Unionist, but you couldn't really be a Catholic loyalist because that was associated with the loyal orders like the Orange Order, the Apprentice Boys, um, which were exclusively Protestant. And, um, you know, loyalists were often anti-Catholic. How was the border decided then and which counties would stay in the Union and which wouldn't? Oh, my goodness. You asked me to go on to the 1920s. Well, it was just agreed that the six counties would be uh, excluded, which had Unionist majorities. Unionist and Protestant are not the same. It is true that most uh, Protestants are Unionists, but they're Catholic Unionists too. You don't have to be a, a Protestant to be a Unionist. Um, so that's that. It was slight Catholic majorities in, in, in Armagh and Tyrone. Uh, but that doesn't mean there were nationalist majorities in those counties, though there now are, actually. Um, anyway, so uh, one of the military commanders in Ireland was Gerard Lake, who'd served um, in America trying to fight against the revolution. And Gerard Lake was very harsh. He was commanding in, in Ulster, and it was the hotbed of the United Irish activity. So there were government agents spying on the United Irishmen and arresting United Irishmen. There was a law against administering illegal oaths. You weren't allowed to swear people into and to a secret organisation. Um, so uh, William Moore was someone who was who supposedly swore some soldiers from the British Army into the United Irishman, and he was he was hanged for that. There's a song about it, The Wake of William Moore, 
And uh, when the when the 1798 rebellion broke out, one of these slogans was "Remember Willie Orr." Um, but uh, the also the testimony against him was very flimsy. It was I think only two witnesses, the soldiers supposedly sworn in by him, one of whom then retracted his evidence. So on the testimony of a single person and against his own denial, he was sent to his death. That's completely unfair. There's absolutely not enough evidence. So Gerard Lake would go from town to town and anyone who suspected was an United Irishman, he would have them publicly flogged. So it was horrific. Um, uh, torture was being used and not on a tiny scale. People occasionally pitch capped as never have a, some hot tar put onto their head and things like that. Half hanging, as in put a rope around your neck and suspended by it, not to kill you, let you down after a minute, but terrifying. They'd be so frightened you just tell them anything so they wouldn't do that. As in who's in the United Irishman, where are the weapons hidden, what are the plans? And people obviously reveal details because who can stand up to that? But there was completely innocent people who were subjected to this to this sort of treatment. Now, obviously, there was no surveillance technology in those days. They had no listening devices, no security cameras. They hadn't invented, um, hadn't invented uh, fingerprinting even. So how did intelligence work? It really by someone telling you things, unless you managed to intercept letters, have to have an agent inside the organisation or else capture someone as a member of it and force them to tell you what's what, who, what's going on, who's in the organisation, what are the plans and where are the guns hidden. Um, so Gerard Lake said only terror will keep them in order. I mean, he was fairly effective against the United Irishmen in Ulster. He arrested a lot of people. He prevented them being so well armed. But he also infuriated and alienated people with the injustice of this brutal treatment, perhaps made more people want to join the United Irishmen. So anyway, um, uh, the French were on the march elsewhere. In 1798, Napoleon, he considered coming to Ireland. Actually, he set sail for Egypt. The idea to conquer Egypt, then nominally part of the Ottoman Empire, the titular ruler of Egypt was the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire in, in, in uh, Istanbul, but then called Constantinople. And the Ottomans were British allies at the time. Um, and then he said, well, I'll disrupt British communications with Egypt, which was ludicrous because people sailed around the Cape of Good Hope to, to, to sorry, to British communications with India. People sailed around the Cape of Good Hope to India. They didn't go via Egypt. The Suez Canal wasn't built. So he did briefly consider whether one could be built. And then one of his Napoleon's bright ideas was to march all the way across um, what's now, say, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, um, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into what's now India. How many thousands of miles is that across hostile territory, across deserts, across mountains? Crazy. It wasn't going to happen. But anyway, if he had come to Ireland, history might have been very different. With his military genius, and the, the, the French put all their resources into that, very likely they would have won. So June 1798, the rebellion um, broke out. The United Irishmen decided the time was ripe. The British army was engaged against the French at many points in, in, in mainland Europe. You love your videos. Thank you. From Connecticut, USA. I have visited Connecticut, that guy, that place where Basil Rathbone was from. I went to that, um, that his, his amazing mansion high on the bluffs above the Connecticut River. Where are we? Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't remember who first came up with this adage. England's difficulties, Ireland's opportunity. So mail coaches were going out from Dublin because um, obviously letters had to be carried. There was no uh, telecommunications and by um, horse-drawn carriages. And so fairly wealthy people would pay to be passengers on these um, horse-drawn coaches with only like, say, six seats in each. But they'd also be carrying letters. That's how the postal service work. Um, anyway, uh, so the mail coaches were stopped to disrupt governmental communications. Sometimes the passengers, civilians, were just killed by the United Irishmen. Um, uh, and that was also a signal that the, the, the rebellion was on to try and seize various um, points around the place. There's Dunlavin Green, I think it's in Wicklow, where various suspected United Irishmen were arrested and already been in prison. And the United Irishmen had gathered their forces, were coming to attack the town. And so the uh, the British Army was there and they said, we'll just kill all these suspected United Irish prisoners. So it was, it was a massacre of, I think, dozens of prisoners. But anyway, there was a lot of fighting, in, including in Dublin, but the, the government prevailed quite easily in Dublin. One of the guys who was in the militia in Dublin was Daniel O'Connell, a fact that most nationalists would rather overlook. Daniel O'Connell, a barrister, he came from a wealthy uh, family in Kerry, Catholic family, but there were landowners because we had to have gavel kind inheritance, the Catholic majority. Um, the idea is that nobody would then have too much land because land was wealth, was power. Um, but they had some uh, Protestant friends who agreed to nominally own the land, but actually let the O'Connell family um, uh, hold it. 
and they were also involved in smuggling things, as in tax evasion, um, bringing things in from France. The items they're bringing were not contraband per se, they simply were untaxed. And Daniel O'Connell, his um, uh, uncle Morris Hunting Cap O'Connell, was in the Irish regiment in the service of, of, of King Louis XVI of France. And the um, Irish community in France was so horrified by the French Revolution that they offered their services to King George III. But anyway, so Daniel O'Connell, he'd been in France uh, during the time of the French Revolution and was appalled by revolutionary violence and said, well, that's why I've got to, got to fight for King George against these revolutionaries, because I know how ghastly it is from what went on in France. Because um, we're always told, oh, the militia and the yeomanry, they're barbarians, they're anti-Catholic. Well, shows that's not true. Um, anyway, so there was they were fighting in other points. And so... The, 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 there were really two rebellions in the sense in June 1798. One was in Ulster, you know, a County Down and Antrim mainly, and the other one was mostly in Wexford. There was a bit of fighting in West Cork to begin with. There was a Sinn Fein speaker and, in Clonakilty every summer about that. But um, anyway, so in the north, it's a mainly Presbyterian rebellion, somewhat, uh, somewhat Anglican. Not many Catholics involved, and um, the government had tried to persuade Protestants to be against the United Irishmen, saying, oh, it's a it's a papist thing, as in that's a word for Catholics. We'd never call ourselves papists. Uh, um, so there was the Battle of Ballina Hinch and the Battle of St. Field. Anyway, the government forces prevailed. Roddy McCauley was was uh, captured. He was executed by hanging at um, uh, at Tomb Bridge. That's why there's this um, fabulous song, Roddy McCauley goes to die on the bridge of tomb today. Um, uh the, what how to say there was never a tear in his blue blue eye both bright uh, both bright and gay are they roddy mccauley goes to die in the bridge of tomb today uh and i, I can't remember more of the words of it like about the hemp rope on his neck the gold, golden ringlets clung and there's another one about henry joy mccracken um who was one of the radical leaders um who was in hiding off one of these battles but was caught and 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 um sent to his death um he was hanged um in the middle of Belfast, and I can't remember the lyrics to this one. Um, uh, anyway, I hope they have murdered Henry Joy is one of the lines of it. So Henry Joy McCracken, often known as Henry Joy. Um, so then in the South, it's a, uh, in Wexford, it's almost an entirely Catholic rebellion. Now, um, Archbishop Troy, who was the Archbishop of, of Armagh, he issued um, encyclicals denouncing this rebellion from the pulpit, Letters to be read out in every church saying, no, do not rebel against the crown. The United Irishmen are evil. You've got to support the crown forces. And the United Irishmen, their, their jacquerie broke out in Wexford. And Wexford is mainly Catholic against Protestant, but there were Catholic loyalists as well. And uh, it's like a peasant uprising against the landlords to some extent. And Father Murphy was one of the local Catholic priests, and he initially spoke out against the United Irishmen, don't rebel. But then um, some Crown Forces units behaved so badly that changed his mind, saying, we've got to support the rebels against these brutes. Some of the yeomanry, some of the militia behaved appallingly, some of the Irish army and indeed the, the uh, British army. So then uh, Father Murphy actually led people in battle against the Crown Forces. He was eventually captured and executed. They said he they burnt his body, but I'm not sure if it was he was he hanged on a quarter or something appalling like that. There's a song about it, Boula Vogue, as in a place in, in Wexford. At Boulevard Vogue, as the sun was setting, a rebel hand set the heather blazing. And so on. One of the lines saying, God grant you glory, brave Father Murphy. Um, anyway, so there's a, there's a song about it called The Boys of Wexford, which is a real favourite of John F. Kennedy and his family. We are the boys of Brec Wexford who fought with heart and hand to burst in twain our galling chain and free our native land. I can't remember how more of it goes. Um we bravely fought and conquered at Ross and Wexford Town, and if we failed to keep them, it was drink that brought us down. We had no drink beside us on Tubernearing's day, depending on the uh, broad, bright pike, and well, it worked that way. Um, but um, anyway, so the United Irishmen had a fair degree of success in Wexford and ruled the county very briefly, but the Crown forces rushed, uh, rushed um, reinforcements into the area, um, the uh, United Irishmen there, they captured some Protestants and as well as some Catholic loyalists and burnt them to death in a barn. So there's some sectarian massacres. You might say, oh, it was loyalists, not the anti-Protestant thing, but some Protestants were simply assumed to be loyalists. Um, 
Now, this is how there's a bit of a disconnect between this, because it's a mainly Protestant rising in the north and a mainly Catholic one in the south, indeed an anti-Protestant one. Um, and the trouble is the leadership in Dublin is largely Protestant, partly because the educated people were mostly Protestant as well. So the people who rose up in Wexford, some of them weren't members of the United Irishmen or didn't really understand the ideology. They were against the government. They're against the Protestant establishment. They're against landlordism. They don't want to pay rent. And they all say, well, remember, we're the original people of this island. We used to own this property before you lot invaded a few centuries ago. So then there was um, uh, the Battle of Vinegar Hill, um, at which the Crown forces uh, prevailed. They had numbers and they had uh, just more firepower because the, the ordinary um, tenant farmer who rose up just had his farm tools, his um, pitchfork, his shovel, his axe, whatever. And that was that. So um, Lord Cornwallis had just come to Ireland um, in June 1798, days before the revolt. And he was received coolly by, um, the, by, by high society in, in Dublin, who thought that he wasn't going to be as stern as, as um, uh, his predecessor, Lord Camden. Um, because Cornwallis, um, I know he'd been um, in America and fighting there, but Cornwallis um, was not the person you might think he was. His opinions were not as rigid or as um, conservative as you might imagine. And he'd been somewhat sympathetic to the complaints of the American revolutionaries and saying, OK, there have been some bad decisions here. There's been some unfairness. We ought to meet them halfway. But he'd been ordered to defeat the American Revolution. And he was a professional soldier. He said, well, I've voluntarily taken an oath to the crown to obey my orders. I will obey orders. I will carry out my mission uh, to, the, to the best of my ability and attempt to defeat the revolution. He failed, as we know. Um, and in Ireland, uh, he felt likewise. He was minded to reform, and he also tried a few amnesties, sometimes persuading um, rebels to lay down their arms and that their lives would be spared. And, and they, they were. Because the thing is, um, otherwise, uh, the uh, Crown forces were told, if you take them under, under arms, you don't spare their lives, you execute them because they're not soldiers, they're traitors. King George III is their king. They are... Um, giving aid and comfort to the king's enemies in time of war, the French army, Theobald Wolf Tony gone to France, enlisted their support. So that's that. They can, they can be put to death for this. Remember, the death penalty was, was widely used at the time for what we would consider uh, trivial offences, like um, grand larceny, stealing a purse, or things like that. Um, anyway, so uh, that was that. So uh, that there was such a bloodletting in, in June uh, 1798. About 20,000 people were killed in a month. And then the situation calmed down. So the, the, the thing is, the United Irishmen, where are the French? The French army was supposed to land. But the thing is, the, the um, uh, Crown forces had got a hold of information and arrested some key members of the United Irishmen and were just getting all the information out of them. And so that's why they had to go ahead. And but the thing is, the, the ships couldn't sail to timetable in those days. They were dependent on the wind. This is the age of sail. There were no steam engines. And if the wind is against you and the tides are against you, you can't go. And the other thing is, um, how long does it take to sail from France to Ireland? Three days? Ten days? It depends. It varies. They can't tell you precisely. Um, but finally, in August 1798, the French army did land. But it was too late because most of the rebels had been defeated. Um, but they landed on the west coast of Ireland um, in County Mayo. And Lazare Hoche was the French commander who landed there. So a couple of thousand French soldiers. And um, they uh, won the Battle of Castle Bar. Great success for them, the so-called Castle Bar races, where the Crown forces fled so fast and left behind a lot of their equipment. Um, uh, the Crown forces commander there was Heli, Heli, Heli Hutchinson. Um, anyway, then Gerard Lake, that commander, um, he gathered uh, more experienced forces and he led them to Ballon Muck, right in the middle of Ireland, where they clashed with the United Irishmen. A lot of these rebels in from from, uh, from Connacht, they were not members of the United Irishmen and they really knew nothing about its programme, but they were anti-government. Anyway, Ballon and Muck was a, was a victory for the Crown forces and um, uh, several hundred uh, rebels uh, surrendered at that point, taken as prisoners to Dublin. Some of them were executed just outside um, what's now Collins Barrack. There's an area called Croppy's Acre. It was sometimes called Croppies because they cut their hair very short. Um, is that an anti-lice thing? I don't know. Um, and that's why some loyalists uh, began to call all Catholics or anyone they thought was a nationalist a croppy and say croppies lie down as and submit. Um, so uh, that's that. Um, so really, that was the end of it, August 1798. And what were the fate? Why, why did the United Irishmen fail? Obviously, 
lack of public support. There was considerable support. Um, the fact that maybe sectarianism, the anti-Catholicism of some of the people in Wexford, put off some of the Protestants who were wavering, who might have been neutral, but then made to be pro-Crown, or might have been pro-rebel, but were at least neutral because of that, uh, and um, things like that, because uh, many uh, Catholics were horrified by what happened in France to the, to the um, Catholic Church. Having said that, by this time, the French government had reconciled with the, with the Catholic Church, but that news hadn't filtered through to Ireland. News travelled slowly. There were a few newspapers, and obviously the fastest anything could travel was the speed of a galloping horse. Um, Henry Joy McCracken is my favourite United Irishman. Why is that lessons for life? Um, so, uh, you know, Robert Emmett, he managed to, to escape the roundup at this time. There was James Napper Tandy, for example, who managed to get to Germany, one of the minor German states. He was later um, uh, kidnapped by Crown agents and shipped back to Ireland to stand trial. But at his trial, he argued that um, his uh, abduction from, from Germany had been a breach of international law, and he won his case. On that basis, he was set free, allowed to return to France. The story of how to refuse up to give up the names of his comrades, a tale of hardihood and fortitude. So that's, there's a song about James Napper Tandy. Um, Napper was not actually his name. It's his James. Um, the wearing of the green is the one about him. By the way, it's only at this time that green becomes associated with um, 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 Ireland as such, because we've got four provinces. The eastern one is Leinster, and the flag of Leinster's got a green field with that um, gold harp with a woman's face in it. And the United Irishmen often had mottos like, it is new, strong, and shall be played. No link for PayPal and George. Spelling out your name could help. Okay, Carla Rutherford. So it's, it's G-E-O-R-G-E-C-A-L-L-A-G-H-A-N-7-9 at gmail.com. So George Callahan 79 at gmail.com. All one word, all small letters. George Callahan 79 at gmail.com. That's my PayPal account. Thank you. Please make a most liberal donation because I need these to sustain the channel. Um, so what else about uh, 1798? Um, yeah, so Lord Cornwallis, he'd succeeded. He only stayed in Ireland uh, for two more years. 1801, he left. He was later sent to India in 1805, but he died only two and a half months after he arrived. That was his second stint in India. He's buried just outside Cal Calcutta. I think it's called Aligarh, not Aligarh, um, a Muslim university. Um, and uh, Gerard Lake, he went back to England and lived on a few more years. Um, so it was a, such a, obviously, a smashing defeat for the United Irishmen, and the organisation just um, ceased uh, to exist pretty much. Although Robert Emmett, he did attempt another rising in 1803, um, because um, shortly after this, 1801, the um, United Kingdom made peace with, with France, the Peace of Amiens, as in Amiens and France, where they negotiated. And then um, that's why there's Amiens, or there was Amiens Street in Dublin. It should be Amiens, but pronounced that like Connolly Station used to be called Amiens Street Station. Anyhow, the, the peace uh, lasted only a year. Both the British and French accused each other of breaking it, preparing for war. To some extent, they were both using it as a breathing space. But on the other hand, they couldn't quite trust the other side. Anyway, 1802, the war broke out afresh. So Robert Emmett decided, let's try this rising again. And then he had an underground factory preparing weapons. Such a shame the vision of Catholic Protestant dissent altogether could not be achieved in a free United Ireland. I hope it will be. Well, why not achieve it in a free United British Isles? Why not the dream of um, uh, Irish, Welsh, Scots and English? Um, and we're very multi-religious and multi-ethnic now. Anyway, so Robert Emmett's uh, this uh, secret weapons factory blew up. Not not killing anyone, but the, the explosion was noisy and it was going to draw attention. So he had to bring forward the date of his rebellion in 1803, before he was ready. So it went off half-cocked, and the premature rebellion failed. So really some of his guys just would had a street brawl um, just outside Dublin Castle. They stopped the coach with Lord Kilwarden in it, dragged him as nephew out, and, and, and butchered them on the spot. So um, it was a very low-level um, uh, fight. But anyway, he was, ra he was quickly captured, Robert Emmett, and put on trial. Um, and the, he had a girlfriend called Sarah Curran. She was daughter of a, of a very prominent uh, barrister, John Philpot Curran. And uh, when they couldn't find Robert Emmett, he was in hiding for a while. They, they found his, his girlfriend's maid, Anne Devlin, and she was arrested and um, she was uh, tortured and her family were arrested and she wouldn't give up details. Eventually, Robert Emmett was captured 
and he eventually pleaded with her to just say what needed to be said so they just would stop harming her. He was sunk anyway. So he's found guilty of high treason by Lord Morton Mulberry. And he gave a um, very truculent speech from the dock. He knew he was doomed, so he might as well go down all guns blazing, um, saying, uh, well, um, at the end, um, uh, yeah, when Ireland takes uh, her place amongst the nations of, of, the, of the world, then let my epitaph to be written. Epitaph is in the um, inscription on his gravestone. Um, so that was that. He wanted the com complete separation. He said, yes, well, obviously we're invaded. And um, so we're ruled by Englishmen or the servants of Englishmen. And if the French invaded us, I would fight against them and let the last entrenchment of liberty be my grave. So he was sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered. And indeed it was done outside St. Catherine's uh, Church, Dublin. And so it was a, a, a horrific uh, death. I mean, hanging in those days was bad enough because it, it was not the long drop. It was a short drop left to strangle over up to 20 minutes. But hanging, drawing, quartering, I shan't even describe it. But um, so it was a very rare sentence, that hanging, drawing, quartering, because it was so much more agonising. It was only for high treason. Um, so that was that. People were used to public execution. They were going on until 1868. And they were used to the sight of blood, to animals' blood. A lot of people were farmers slaughtering animals, not the people who were animals. But even so, it was ghastly. I should have said about... Um, yeah, 1798. Um, uh, Wolf Tone, he'd only, was only getting to Ireland in late 1798, yeah? And um, his French warship um, was then captured after a brief naval skirmish off the coast of Donegal. Now, he'd got himself a commission in the French army, and so he, he posed as a French army officer, which it was sent he was. But when he was under arrest, he was recognised by an, uh, an Irish officer who knew him from Dublin, and so he was charged with high treason. When you're not a Frenchman, you're an Irishman, uh, George III is the King of Ireland. So uh, he was tried for high treason. He was found guilty and sentenced uh, to, to uh, hang. So he requested that he be shot as a soldier. It was a soldierly death. But no, the answer came back. You're a felon. You're not a soldier. Hello, Caroline Maslin. So I don't know how he got a head hold of a sharp implement in prison. He managed to slit his throat and kill himself. But what he did know at the time is some of his friends had tried to get a stay of execution. Loyalists need to remember that many of the Irish nationalist heroes were Protestant, Tone, McCracken, Parnell and Emmett. Yes, and we need to remember that uh, so many Catholics were loyalists, especially in those days. So many Catholics have volunteered for the Royal Irish Army, for the British Army, for the Royal Navy, for the Royal Air Force, for the Royal Marines and so on. Um, that obviously monarchy is the tradition in Ireland that um, almost all of us have some ancestry from Wales, Scotland and Great Britain. And there's so many Irish people in Great Britain. In Great Britain, at least one in six people has got partial Irish ancestry. So we're really one of the same people. Um, anyway, so that was more or less the end of the United Irishman by 1803, the death of uh, Robert Emmett. His brother Thomas Amet, uh, Addis Emmett went to New York, where he's a prominent lawyer. And, and Devlin, Sarah uh, Curran's um, maid, she was set free. Um, she only said about a year in prison. But uh, she, uh, she lived in relative penury, in the liberties of Dublin, dying in, in, in 1851. I feel, given the present circumstances, the probability of the island of Ireland as a republic is more than it is as part of the Union. I don't quite agree, but it might happen, and people have been saying this for a century. Yeah, Republic of Ireland is a, is a magnificent place. We've achieved a lot these days. We have a prosperous economy. We have a sensible political system. We have a good electoral system. There's a lot I like about it. I mean, I don't want to be part of the European Union. It's not terrible, uh, and that's that. I mean, uh, Dr. Varadkar, I met him years ago when he was, he was an undergraduate and very decent, unshowy in politics for the right reasons. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a tolerable president, all the rest of it. No disasters, really. Sensible policies, good economic growth, good education. Yeah. No disasters, actually, about the right level of immigration, which is why there's not much opposition to it. But, um, yeah, there was a guy called Michael O'Dwyer, one of the United Irishmen, and he, he led a partisan campaign in the Wicklow Mountains uh, for several years into the early 19th century. And Gerard Lake, he helped build a military road into the Wicklow Mountains because if you ever tried walking over a mountain where it's just like heather or just muddy or rocky, you'll see that's difficult. It does make a big difference uh, walking on a proper road. Obviously, you can't stay completely on the road, get somewhere up into the mountains, and then fan out to find the rebels. Your name shows your Irish patriotism, George. Would you say you're patriotic but national, not nationalist? Well, yeah, spot on, because I, I don't want to separate from Great Britain. Um, do I love my country? Sometimes that seems a bit too strong, a bit too schmaltzy. There are things about it that I do love, and there are certain 
melodies I can hear. I feel my scalp moving. I get a bit sentimental or dewy eyed about things like that or or magnificent achievements. But I try to say you've got to be objective, lay aside emotion and, um, you know, see what's good and so what's bad and not childishly assume that I have some a great deal in common with Irish people or, or anyone else who's Irish must be a good person, especially if in dispute with somebody who's not Irish, things like that. You know, I'm quite uh, enthused about the uh, Rugga World Cup that, uh, you know, we're sixth in the world, Ireland, and, you know, we could even win this time, which I never would have said previously. Um, so, uh, hello there, John Mora, Joanne Maurer. So, in 1898, it was, it was commemorated a lot, the 1798 Rebellion and the Home Rule Party, the dominant party in Ireland at that time, had no hesitation in retrospectively endorsing the United Irishman, despite the Home Rule Party being a constitutional party and not wanting to use force and, and not even wanting to leave the United Kingdom, only wanting a Home Rule within the UK. The Irish Home Rule Party, by 1898, wanted more or less what Scotland's situation is now within the UK. They didn't want a republic. Um, so but things have become rather less radical. Um, any more reflections on this? Yeah, when the French landed, hello from Denmark, Anna, um, but you've got, a, you've got an Icelandic name, Haugstotter, Iceland, and Anna, no surname. I've been to Reykjavik one time, Smoking Bay, not this kind of smoking because of the volcano. Where was I? Um, yeah, so it was, it was a very radical era, but uh, the rebels were so smashed, certainly by 1803, there was no attempted rising till um, 1847, the year, the worst year of the famine. Um, or 1848, I should say, like the year of revolutions. Um, so some people lived on for a long time. John Kells Ingram, when he was at, at Trinity College Dublin um, in um, eighteen in the 1840s, he wrote, um, Who Spears to, Fears to Speak of 98, Who Blushes at the Name? And this um, very stirring rebel ballad. So lots of come all years, as in come all you, but we say come all year. These um, uh, dewy-eyed... Uh, songs about this these these rebellions there's a famous one by the rising of the moon um tell me captain farrell why do you hurry so hush mabukal hush and listen and his cheeks were all aglow, aglow by the get you ready quick and soon uh, by the rising of the moon and a thousand blades were flashing by the rising of the moon why isn't the united irish football team good point well there were two football associations in ireland and that was that that was a that was partition ironically the football association of ireland is the one in the north it's called the Irish League, which is only in Northern Ireland. And then, um, I can't remember what we call it, the Republic of Ireland. And um, there were some teams from the north, like Derry City, play in the league with the Republic. A um, bit like Cardiff and Wales, they play in the English League. What era of history do you hate the most? Oh my goodness. Well, I'm not really into very ancient history, because early antiquity, we just know so little about it. Um, so uh, that's that. The Orange Order still exists. And the active union came along. They thought, well, the only way to preserve some sort of connection to Ireland and Great Britain is to have the union. So it completely backfired for the United Irishmen. That legislation was introduced in 1799, defeated in the in the um, Irish Parliament. And um, ironically, some people who voted against it said things like, you know, um, I will be like the Carthaginians in the days of your pledge my children to fight to the utmost and to the last drop of their blood against the enemy, in this case, Great Britain. And uh, at the hour of my dissolution, I will swear them to fight on and things like that. Using this kind of language, I can't remember who said that. Um, and these will be some of the people who'd, who'd fought against the United Irishmen because the Irish Parliament, they regard themselves as Irish and they were and the political nation. But I suppose they thought, well, we can't have Hoi Polloi having a say in things. But then, anyway, so the legislation was introduced again in 1800. By this time, the government uh, offered a lot of douceur. And there was enough swill in the trough to persuade people to vote for it. So it passed. Um, and that was the Act of Union passed, which kicked in on New Year's Day, 1801. So they were very open jobs. So jobbery was frank. And there was no law against that. That was the other side would offer reducements as well, but they couldn't offer so many because they weren't the executive. So that was that. We, we merged with um, Great Britain. But it was a pretty democratic era. I was going to say, when the French landed in Connacht, in August 1798, they brought a printing press and they printed things in English, fascinatingly, not in Irish. There was a very Irish-speaking province um, offering a democratic republic. Wow, a democratic, a word that was all but unknown at the time. Ancient history, the most fun anyone can speculate. Are you familiar with Michael Tsarion and his occult history of Ireland? No, I've never heard of it before. 
Um, so that was that was an idea of democracy. If the United of Irishmen had succeeded, would we have been better off? Maybe. Now, we probably would have ended up as a satrapy of France, but being in the French orbit would have been so bad. French satellites, well, Napoleon eventually putting one of his siblings on the throne. You can you shed some light on Irish folk songs such as The Wearing of the Green? Well, The Wearing of the Green is, is alludes to James Napper Tandy, one of these United Irish leaders who I, who I referred to earlier. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, being a French satellite wouldn't have been that bad, I suppose. Would have been good if we could have got rid of sectarian discrimination. So it might have been better if it succeeded, in fact. We just don't really know, because a revolutionary necessarily involves um, some turmoil, some bloodshed. But how much? Supposing you agree with the objectives of the United Irishman, would it be worth it if one person died to achieve that? Maybe. What if it's 100,000? Probably not, out of a population of 4 million. What if it's a million? Definitely not. The question is, how many people are going to get killed? You don't know when you start this conflict. Will it turn out to be as idyllic as you think? It might do. What if it doesn't? If you're very close, it's fine. If you're quite far, maybe still worth it. If you're very far, you don't know. You might make the situation worse. You're just not sure. But um, before, they usually weren't liked. So you'd have to be very naive to assume that the French didn't want something for it. Can I ask what your IQ is? You can, 122. But it depends enormously. I'm very low at spatial awareness and maths. I got 145 in, in verbal ability. All right, so that's everything for the moment. Please um, keep me sustained with uh, generation with, with donations, which are most generous um, on, on, on uh, Patreon or PayPal, even better. George Callahan 79 at gmail.com on PayPal. And your liberality will be warmly appreciated. Otherwise, this channel can't keep going, going request things, request me to make videos, get all your friends and neighbours to subscribe. I teach online, I teach on Skype, history, English, literature, English is a foreign language. You seem to be a great multitasker, thank you so much. French, uh, what else? Geography, politics, debating, public speaking, elocution, prepare people for job interviews, and all sorts of exams, 11+, plus, 13+, plus, 16+, plus, you know, GCSEs, A-levels, university, law, uh, I've got a law degree as well, law taster courses, things like that. I'm a tour guide in London. So do contact me. Signing off now. Good night, all.